How would a Sino-Russian alliance change the world? With a recent state visit to Moscow by Chinese President Xi Jinping, many are wondering if China and Russia are taking their relationship to the next level. But instead of moving in together to a cute apartment by the river, they're teaming up to basically be the worst duo since pineapple and pizza. But this relationship seems to be more complicated than it appears at first glance, and fears of a Sino-Russian alliance may be overblown. On February 4, 2022, Xi Jinping invited Vladimir Putin to the opening of the Olympic Games in Beijing. Afterwards, the two sides held strategic talks and probably punched puppies or whatever two villains do for fun. The terrible twosome then declared that China and Russia's partnership was, quote, greater than a traditional alliance, and that their friendship would, quote, know no limits. China and Russia were even better than BFFs, they were super BFFs, and nothing could come between them as they set their eyes on upending the liberal world order and reshaping it in their image. And then Russia invaded Ukraine. To be fair, Russia's invasion of Ukraine was not what drove the wedge between Beijing and Moscow, but rather it was Russia's absolutely horrible execution of this war. China doesn't mind backing a war of aggression against a peaceful neighbor. That is literally what it's planning to do right now, as the CCP has committed to reunifying Taiwan with the mainland before the party's first centennial anniversary. However, what China does mind is a loser, and with its failure to take Kyiv and forced retreat from North Ukraine, Russia was very much a loser. The fall counterattack by Ukraine only served to weaken Russia further in China's eyes, and suddenly Chinese officials were very much putting limits to its no-limits relationship. Don't be fooled, China doesn't care about Russia targeting civilians or the various atrocities Russia's committed in Ukraine. What China cares about is how disastrous Russia's invasion has been for China's own geopolitical goals. Knowing that it would almost certainly have to invade Taiwan to bring it back into the fold, China was counting on its massive economic influence to polarize a global response to its invasion and prevent the West from unifying against it. The United States does over $1 trillion in trade with Europe every year, but China is rapidly catching up at just around $700 billion. The US might be the bigger trading partner, but China is still a significant enough partner that opposing it would be economically painful for Europeans, especially as China is also a major supplier of rare earth minerals that the modern world needs so badly. If Russia had won in Ukraine, the West wouldn't have had the chance to unify against it. Largely self-interested European states like Germany and France would have been happy to offer a few harsh words, some sanctions, but continue with business ties with the Russian industry. Frontline NATO states like Poland and the Baltic states would have understandably been far more vocal about punishing Russia, while the US, with its own pending confrontation with China and the Pacific, would have ill-afforded to try to punish Russia significantly on its own and been happy to focus on the Pacific. Instead, Russia in its failure did the unthinkable, unified Europe and roused it from its peace dividend slumber induced by the fall of the Soviet Union. The transatlantic relationship under the severe strain after President Trump's tenure in office was not just repaired but strengthened, with European powers admitting to President Trump's biggest contention, they weren't spending enough on their own defense. If you'd had to tell any geopolitical analysts on February 23, 2022 that in one year, Europe would unify, two more nations would apply to join NATO with one already admitted in the organization, Russian energy would be almost completely eliminated from Europe, and major European powers would revitalize defense spending, they would have laughed you out of the room. But one year on, the West has not just fallen into lockstep, major non-Western powers such as South Korea, Australia, and Japan have rallied to their banner. You know who's not laughing at the current situation? President Xi Jinping, who sees now Putin's failure, has set a precedent for the world to unite against him in his attempt to take Taiwan by force. Thus, as the new year started, China's made it clear that the Chinese-Russian partnership indeed had limits. And most importantly, after his recent state visit to Moscow, President Xi Jinping left Russia without approving a major new pipeline to be built from Russia to China, a major foreign policy objective of Vladimir Putin, who needs Chinese investment in a project which would help offset the extremely painful loss of European energy market. Perhaps it's no coincidence, then, that prior to his visit to Moscow, Chinese mapmakers had been ordered to use old Chinese names for the outer Manchuria territory seized by Russia from China in the 19th century. With news outlets around the world picking up the story, the change to official state maps was a clear message to Moscow. China wants its territory back, but China might want more than this, as it has its eyes set on the Russian Far East at a time when Moscow is rapidly losing influence in its own Far Eastern territories. Here, Chinese investments vastly outnumber Russian investments, and with ethnic Russians steadily migrating out of the Far East, Chinese immigrants have been taking their place and adding to the number. In a few decades' time, the Russian Far East would be better named the Chinese Far North, 
And with some of the largest energy deposits in the world at stake, both Moscow and Beijing are extremely motivated to either keep this region under Russian control or undermine Russian control over it. It seems unthinkable that Russia would part with a massive and very lucrative piece of its own territory, but as Russia's economic situation deteriorates, and as it faces defeat in Ukraine, the RFE, or at least Outer Manchuria, might become a chip on the table to be bargained between China and Russia. Cash-rich China currently holds most of the cards, and Russia's only bargaining chip at the moment is energy. With a third-rate military being ground into dust, Russia has become China's vassal in all but name, and both sides know it. However, Russia does maintain nuclear weapons, though if the state military in Ukraine is anything to go by, Russia would be lucky if half of those very expensive to maintain weapons still actually work or can even get up into the air. All of this makes a Sino-Russian alliance extremely unlikely, though not impossible. Vladimir Putin might have been humiliated by Xi Jinping's snub as he left Moscow without signing a very much needed pipeline deal, but both sides have considerable benefits to offer each other, making an alliance plausible. For its part, Russia remains an energy and raw materials superpower. It's no surprise that the largest country in the world is also home to the largest deposits of energy and various industrial minerals in the world. China just so happens to be hungry for both as the nation continues to grow and expand, catapulting itself from second world nation to first world near superpower in just a matter of decades. The Chinese miracle has been fueled by truly titanic amounts of copper, steel, and iron and an equally huge gulp of hydrocarbons. As China sets its eyes on dethroning the United States as sole global superpower and most influential nation on Earth, it's going to need even more vast quantities of both to continue fueling its growth. For Russia's part, China is both the world's largest piggy bank and market in the world. Russian goods desperately need new markets after the nation is bearing the most punishing sanctions in history by the West, and China has over a billion consumers. Unfortunately, Russian exports are primarily energy products and food. Which for China means that Russia is an easily controlled partner that doesn't threaten to upset its lesser partner status in the Sino-Russian relationship. However, Chinese investment is also desperately needed by Russia, especially as the nation is facing growing inefficiencies in producing and transporting energy products due to a technology ban from the West and the pullout of Western businesses from Russia. So, with as many reasons to partner as not to partner, what would happen if these two tag-teamed the world together? Could they really bring down the liberal world order and usher in a new age of authoritarianism as they reshape the world in their own image? The first and most obvious consideration would be the military capabilities of a Sino-Russian alliance. The war in Ukraine has shown Russia is a third-rate military power, but the nation still has some significant capabilities and advantages even over the US. Its hypersonic missile program, for example, is more mature, even if the actual usefulness of hypersonic weapons has been greatly overblown by the media. Russian expertise in building formidable air defenses is also significant. Though the war in Ukraine has given the world reason to doubt some of the most incredible claims about Russia's S-400 air defense units, its T-14 Armada does seem to be a considerable threat to modern armor, but Russia is too broke to actually build it. And that's where Chinese investments could come in, especially with technology transfers from Russia to China. China's own military has long been ranked second to Russia's. But this has largely been due to the disparity in the number of nuclear weapons between the two states. On paper, Russia does field more hardware, with over a thousand more combat planes, 600 more helicopters, and 8,000 more tanks. However, as Ukraine has proven, most of Russia's equipment is hot garbage. And while Russia's touted it has 12,000 tanks in reserve, the truth is it's been hard-pressed to replace nearly 2,000 lost tanks in one year of fighting. And even now, the tanks rolling into Ukraine include T-54s and T-55s, so it's safe to say the actual balance between the two militaries is much closer to parity than it appears at first glance. In terms of military power, there's actually little that Russia adds to the alliance currently. Its military is too heavily embroiled in Ukraine to be of any use elsewhere. In fact, it's doubtful Russia could currently deter a NATO invasion without resorting to nuclear weapons, and its lack of armored vehicles is so severe its soldiers have been forced to World War style mass infantry assaults with predictable results. The Russian Navy has few capable guided missile frigates, but overall it's not just small in numbers, its very readiness and ability to survive combat is in question. Since the sinking of the Moskva, Russia has barred its Black Sea fleet from straying too far from the safety of port, and this along with the sinking has raised serious questions about Russia's fleet. In short, the Moskva should physically have been impossible to sink with just two anti-ship missiles, and the disaster along with Russia's decision to bottle its fleet up has led many to speculate that Russian ships suffer from some fatal construction flaw. 
At the very least, it appears as if the air defense surface combatants can't actually provide air defense at all. In short, China's getting the short end of the stick here. That that's only looking at things short term, because the truth is that a long term alliance could have considerable dividends for China if it were to directly invest in rebuilding the Russian armed forces. For one, Russia's greatest problem is not a lack of talented weapons engineers, but rather the corruption that seeped deep into the bones of every facet of Russian society. With Chinese investments and reforms, the Russian defense sector, one of the largest in the world, could soon be pumping out capable weapon systems at prodigious rates. However, Russia's greatest benefit to China could be Russian soldiers themselves. Not that they're particularly better than any other nation, but in the fact that Russian society is incredibly tolerant of casualties. While China faces the possibility of significant civil unrest if it were to incur massive casualties in an assault on Taiwan, the Russian society is accustomed to suffering and would shoulder the burden of apocalyptic casualties with ease. No other nation suffered like Russia during the Second World War, and the estimated 200,000 casualties suffered in one year of war proves that the Russian people have retained their ancestors' appetite for loss. China's own military strengths include the world's third operable fifth-generation aircraft fleet, or more accurately, four-and-a-half-ish generation. We're talking about 150 J-20s in service. China might not be fielding a stealth aircraft truly comparable to America's F-22 or F-35, but one that is low observable and advanced enough to pose a deadly threat to fourth-generation aircraft and their supporting assets. Plus, China's proven it has the financials and the logistics capabilities to keep an advanced air fleet operational and growing, even as it's now working on what it says will be a true sixth-generation aircraft. Even if China never truly closes the technological gap between itself and the US, and this is debatable, the fact that it's able to field a significant amount of advanced aircraft and pursue research into even more advanced weapons platforms already proves it's a significant contender. Exporting these capabilities to Russia would only strengthen its ability to challenge the US, especially as it leverages Russia's expertise in ground combat systems and air defenses. The Sino-Russian alliance, however, would also help solve China's biggest problem, geography. Currently, the nation is hemmed in by the First Island Chain, a chain of islands made up of US allies and partners running from Japan to Taiwan and down to the Philippines. From here, any attempt to project power out to the Pacific is beyond hampered by vulnerability to anti-ship attack. However, an alliance with Russia could allow China to exert greater global pressure by building joint bases in Russia's borders with the West. And Russia might be amenable to this joint military partnership, even if it's on its own soil. An influx of Chinese weapon systems into NATO's borders with Russia would make Russians feel a lot more secure against the Western alliance. Even if NATO has never had plans to invade Russia, what it would do is make Russian demands a lot more credible to the EU and NATO as it expands closer to Russia's borders, and to help shore up its greatly deteriorated credibility in the wake of its military's disastrous performance in Ukraine. For China, being able to station large amounts of hardware near Europe has a direct benefit for its Pacific ambitions. Currently, the only real leverage that China has over Europe is its massive trade balance, but the US is not just a bigger trading partner, it also is much more ideologically aligned with Europe. That makes the likelihood of at least the majority of Europe backing the US in a conflict extremely likely. Even without committing military hardware, an economic embargo of China would be painful for both, but more painful for China. It's easy for Europe to be brave when China is literally on the other side of the planet, however. The moment that long-range Chinese striking power based off of Russian bases can reach into the heart of Europe, we expect that there will be a significant rethinking of European support for the US in a case of war, especially an invocation of Article 5 by NATO. A Pacific war would almost certainly begin with a Chinese attack against American bases across the Pacific. For China to have any hope of victory, it needs to strike hard and strike fast against US power in the theater. But this would mean the US could invoke Article 5 in response and bring in most of Europe to a shooting war. While neither side's ground forces would play any significant role in a war over Taiwan except for Chinese invasion forces inside Taiwan itself, NATO could still provide the US with invaluable naval and air support. But if China is suddenly sitting in your backyard, some nations might rethink their commitment to Article 5. It's already doubtful if nations like Hungary and Turkey would truly honor their commitment to Article 5 to begin with. And with France's President Macron stating that Europe should seek a third path with China that doesn't follow the US's, even major powers like France might be deterred from joining the war. Simply put, Chinese hardware on Russian territory not only strengthens Russia's credibility, but directly projects Chinese military power to supplement its economic power into the heart of Europe. 
with potential deterrent effects on Europe taking any significant actions against China in case of a war over Taiwan. China also solves Russia's geography problem. For centuries, Russia struggled to gain and keep control over a warm water port. This is what makes the port of Sevastopol so critical to Russian national security. From Sevastopol, Russia can project naval power into the Mediterranean, even if it has to transit the Bosphorus Straits, controlled by Turkey, a NATO member. It's also why it's incredibly unlikely that Russia will ever settle for a political solution in Ukraine that involves giving up control of Crimea. Ukraine will either have to take it by force and risk a possible nuclear escalation or accept a permanent Russian presence, turning Sevastopol into another Russian enclave like Kaliningrad. The stakes are simply too high for Russia. In the Far East, Russia's port at Vladivostok freezes on average for four months. This limits the power that Russia can project into the Pacific and how much trade it can conduct. However, a Sino-Russian alliance could see Russian ships being based out of Chinese ports, bolstering China's own maritime power and granting Russia the access to the year-round warm water ports it's been wanting since the time of Peter the Great. For China, things might get a little crowded, but this isn't necessarily a bad deal. Russia has 11 major surface combatants in its Pacific fleet along with a whole host of smaller missile corvettes designed to hunt for American subs. Its four landing ships would be of significant interest to China, bolstering China's own amphibious assault fleet as it prepares for a military conquest of Taiwan. But it's Russia's 27 Pacific submarines that China would be most interested in. Russian subs are on the whole better than Chinese subs, and it's these undersea combatants who would have a significant role to play in any combat in the Pacific. The relationship would be reciprocal for China as well as access to northern Russian ports would allow the Chinese Navy to bypass some of the first island chain that currently hems the nation's navy in. This string of American allies stretches from Japan to Taiwan and the Philippines and in effect keeps the Chinese Navy boxed in. Stationing a Chinese carrier strike group out of Vladivostok for at least part of the year would seriously complicate a US-Japan-Philippine response to a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. As global warming looses up the Arctic ice pack, New fishing and proving grounds for oil and natural gas also open up. For the alliance, this would open up a huge opportunity to hem the United States and Canada out of Arctic resources. Russian northern coast bases would serve as staging areas for survey and exploration missions funded by China's vast wealth. China's money is exactly what Russian oil needs, while China needs Russia's oil infrastructure and expertise in drilling in Arctic waters. The two nations working together would truly become a hydrocarbon superpower, the likes of which the world has never seen. And even as the world moves to renewable energy, give the Sino-Russian alliance an incredible amount of political power on the world stage. The power of a Sino-Russian alliance can't be overstated, which would force the West to rethink the current world order. As of now, NATO has not been willing to consider expansion into the Pacific. Europe's complacency has largely led it to believe it has no stakes in a Pacific conflict, no matter how misguided such assumptions are. However, a Sino-Russian alliance could push the NATO alliance to strongly consider expanding out of the northern Atlantic and not just to Asia. Japan technically has no need to join NATO as it's an ally of the US already. However, there is a deterrent to being part of a formal multinational treaty organization such as NATO. And with threats to the Western liberal world order arising in Asia, having a globe-spanning alliance structure would allow like-minded forces to quickly respond to threats. More than national security, though, the expansion of NATO outside of the North Atlantic would signal a global shift in ideology, rejecting authoritarianism globally rather than locally. Even if Japan and Australia are NATO partners, having everyone wearing the same team jersey has a very visual effect. NATO would also likely seek to expand its influence deeper into Africa, somewhere that both Europe and America have turned a blind eye to in the last two decades. This has allowed both Russia and China to greatly extend their own influences in the continent with Russian private military companies having direct relationships with many authoritarian African states. Wagner PMC even owns multiple mines of its own, generating billions in revenue for the group. China likewise has been building deeper links with an emerging Africa, spanning multiple countries in its Belt and Road Initiative. Unfortunately, this has often proven to be a debt trap, resulting in China being granted direct control over port facilities and rail hubs. The exact type of infrastructure China's military would need to expand out of Asia and break free of the first island chain. Africa is quickly becoming the most important continent in the world as it lifts itself out of centuries of inner conflict, colonialism, and poverty. It holds some of the richest mineral deposits on Earth. Every year, the continent produces around 1 billion tons of minerals worth $406 billion. This is with largely inefficient mining practices and a vast amount of corruption. 
But as Africa develops, its staggering economic potential is becoming more and more obvious. With 30% of all the world's mineral reserves, 12% of the world's oil, and 8% of the world's natural gas, its greatest prize, however, is its vast gold deposits, with the continent holding 40% of the world's gold. Of even greater importance to modern economies are its vast deposits of chromium and platinum, where it holds a whopping 90% of the entire world's supply. The Democratic Republic of the Congo is significantly important to the modern world, as it produces 63% of the global cobalt supply. Tantalum, used to produce capacitors, is produced in both the DRC and Rwanda, who are both the world's largest suppliers of the mineral. And it's not just vast natural resources that make Africa one of the most important places of the future Earth. That's its developing economy. The continent is home to 1.2 billion people, roughly the same as China. But unlike China, Africa is just getting started. While in the next 50 years, China's population is predicted to collapse to half its current size, by 2100, Africa is expected to be home to 4.2 billion people. The economic potential in Africa's future is truly titanic, and nations are taking note. This is why both Russia and China have been so aggressive about exerting their influence in the developing continent. Unifying their efforts, they might be able to outpace the West, and if Sino-Russian ideology overpowers in Africa, it could spell disaster for the Western world. Currently, the West's greatest strength isn't its military power, though it is the most powerful military force on Earth, but rather its shared values and ideology. The West champions a liberal world order, one based on democracy and human rights. For China and Russia, the only rights humans have is the right to do as the state demands of them, whether that's to die in a battlefield in Ukraine or to die trying to cross the Taiwan Strait under hostile fire. China and Russia are both authoritarian states in direct opposition to the liberal world order, and both know that their continued survival or the survival of their ruling elites depends on undermining and defeating liberalism. This is why China has been so aggressive about expanding its influence into like-minded authoritarian states and subsidizing exports of its mass surveillance technology. Much like the early Soviet Union, China believes its best chance at survival is to continuously expand its authoritarian model and shift the global balance against democracy. Africa shows very disturbing trends toward authoritarianism, and the fight for influence in Africa could be the one that decides the fate of the world. Like we mentioned earlier, by 2100, Africa will have an estimated 4.2 billion people. At that same time, Europe is estimated to have a population of only 420 million. The United States will grow to 394 million. People are power, especially when you consider that a significant amount of these people will be organized into ever more professional military forces. The question is, under which ideology will these future militaries find themselves? Liberal democracies or Sino-Russian authoritarianism? For all its force multipliers, the West's more technologically advanced military simply won't be able to keep the pace with the manpower the continent offers. And if the clash of ideologies leads to an African split, the world could find the start of World War III to be in the heart of Africa, not in Europe or in the Pacific as it's long feared. Now go check out France's World War III plan, or click this other video instead.